Okay, so here's a few news articles you might like. Um, this one was amazing. I, this is a lot of fun to read in its entirety. The, um, the one thing that a lot of people got a kick out of, can you guys hold it down back there? Is that the CIA's password for their hacking tools that got stolen was 123ABCDEF. And they shared it publicly on chat rooms and everything, and everybody knew it, and they just threw it around like crazy, and they had a lot of angry discussions like, this is a really stupid password. The security around here is terrible. Everybody's logging in with the same account, and they didn't do anything about it. And it turned out that's the least of it. Um, my blue team friends are often horrified at the way hackers behave. And I have to talk, they don't show up on time, they're drunk, they don't do what they're supposed to do, they all go off and they break the law, they just make a lot of trouble. And the CIA has the same problem. Red teamers are really an unruly, rebellious, disrespectful lot. And the story of what happened, the guy that they're trying to convict for stealing and leaking the tools, giving them to WikiLeaks, which dumped them as Vault 7, a big vault of CIA hacking tools, Joshua Schultz, his lawyer defending him said, this guy is a total jerk, everybody hates him, but he didn't commit the crime. And it's just amazing what he did. He it actually, they literally had a rubber band war between two of the hackers at the CIA where they were shooting rubber bands at each other. And this guy got so mad that the other guy's desk got close to a window and his wasn't, that he like uh, started a campaign against him. And he had a whole list of like grievances against these people that he kept written down and a whole notebook of how he was gonna take revenge on them. And there's another guy that looks like a pretty good suspect for this, who actually had a screenshot of the same server at the same time it was that was being stolen. And they never actually proved that this guy stole it. They just proved he was in the building when it was getting stolen, but so was the other guy. And it's just amazing. They're like, just like a TV sitcom about hackers and startups of just childish people stupidly insulting each other and betraying each other and just ruining the whole mission. It's just amazing. When I see this kind of like satire on TV, I tend to get offended and say, real hackers aren't like that. But the problem is some of them really are. Like the San Francisco sysadmin that locked the entire city out of the um, Cisco network was the same. He was four times convicted for armed robbery. He would threaten to beat people up and scare them away. He would just do crazy things. Nobody could control him. His own supervisors couldn't control him. That's the problem. These brilliant people tend to be too crazy to be trusted, and yet you need them. And so... Your poor managers try to keep them from going too far out of control, often with disastrous failures. That's a common management principle, but I think it is absolutely not true at this level of skill. I think top red teamers are like rock stars. They're not replaceable. They really are much better than other people. And so you put up with their terrible personality flaws to have them there. Uh, Well, they can be replaced too, but I know. Anyway, it, it, it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing normal business, then everybody's replaceable. But if your business model is we have to be the best in the world, then you're no longer got replaceable people. And the CIA is supposed to have the best in the world. And like the infantry, I think you're totally right. They're replaceable. But anyway, um, so uh, the coronavirus is crazy. And in South Korea, they're going to give people a GPS app in their phone to track where they are to make sure they don't leave quarantine. Um, and so this is uh, a new trick. I mean, a lot of people are worrying about, yeah? yeah. I saw that where they had the drone flying over to get back in your house, put on your mask. Well, you know, that's a use of technology to enforce their restrictions. Um, so this one was pretty amazing. Apple's notes. Apple has secure notes. I didn't know this. I think if you just take the default notes app, which is just their equivalent of notepad, you can make secure notes. I didn't know this. Yeah, this is the notes app. I think I've used it. You make a note and say, I have a secret to tell you. There's a title and here's the contents. The sky is blue. The ocean is wet. And then you can just choose to encrypt it. And if you do, what's that? Oh, oh I, well, I, I, I found it over in 37. Um, oh. And so I was down there for a little bit. Um, yeah. And now the main computer down there, I'm dying to go up the street. I don't oh, know well, I, yeah, well, I, I'm not too surprised. Anyway, so, um, but I, I, I will disavow all knowledge if anyone interrogates me. So anyway, so you get this, you can put a password on your file and then it's supposedly protected. But it turns out this is totally not true. Um, if you look at this, the database where it's stored, if you still have notes open, it keeps a plain text copy in addition to the encrypted copy. And you can just find the strings, at least the first 20 characters or so in plain text there. And even if you closed it, 
you can still find it often. And if you put in images or GPS, you can still find it. Turns out a lot of stuff is still there in various forms. This is a true Microsoft Word, which is what this reminds you of. If you have Microsoft Word and you have an encrypted document, when you open it, it makes a temporary copy of the plain text document in your temp folder. And that is still there if Word is open, and it's still there if Word crashes, and it leaves a forensic footprint, even if it's removed, because deleting doesn't erase it. And so this is a well-known fact. This is why Microsoft invented BitLocker because previously they had this thing called NTFS in EFS, Encryption File Service, and they said all you have to do is encrypt your profile folder, and that will encrypt your desktop and your documents and your pictures and everything, but they found out that these temporary files are created in other folders, and they do make copies of plain text information from your encrypted files, and the only thing you can really do is encrypt the whole hard drive. That is the only thing that would really make you safe. That's why they switched to it. USB what? Uh, well, while it's open, then there would be a copy on the hard drive, but when you shut down the machine, it will all be encrypted and inaccessible. That's what BitLocker does. I think you can encrypt USB sticks. I don't know if you can encrypt just a folder at BitLocker. That's what EFS does. I think BitLocker is all or nothing as far as I know. I know Apple's file vault can be used either way. It does. That's the normal way it's used. The whole drive or the whole system partition. That's, and that's the reason. So that way it gets the page file and all the temp files and the hibernation file and all these files that otherwise would contain information that should have been encrypted. So when it's, so when it's open, open? Yes. When it's open, everything's open. So if you get malware on it that can steal it while you're using it, then these encryption solutions do nothing. None of them do. EFS, file fault, none of them can save you from data in use. And encrypting data in use is essentially an unsolved problem. There's only one commercial product that encrypts data in use, and it's highly experimental. And it, there is a technique called homomorphic encryption that would let you encrypt things and continue to use them while they're encrypted without decrypting them under certain circumstances. But it's incredibly complicated and slow and hard to use, and there's no commercial product in popular use that does it. Um, that's, they consider that the last bastion of security, protecting data while it's in use, which is why the target credit card numbers, they stole them out of RAM on the payment terminals. You have to put it in RAM, at least briefly, to do anything with it with any kind of modern software. So if you can steal the contents of RAM, it's very hard to hide anything from it. Anyway, um, so CheckRain now has a new project, come to CheckRain jailbreak we're using. You can now put Android on your iPhone which is a heroic technical accomplishment. Although the first thing I think is, why would you want to do that? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, I guess you could put Windows on your iPhone or, or the North Korean OS on your iPhone, but why? Anyway, of course, technically, you, you really are in charge if you can do that. It shows, it's like a stunt. It's like you know, standing on one leg and balancing 10 plates on your head. I mean. <laughs> the what? Oh, the, oh, the, the hardware. Oh, well. That, I don't know. I think it's just, just so you can do it, you know. Anyway, so Pakistan's passed strict censorship rules to limit what's on the internet and make sure the government can always see anything, and everybody's freaking out, saying they're not going to obey it. So it's sort of like uh, a lot of nations have tried this. Australia tried it for a while. So the rules are, um, as currently written, would make it very difficult to make services available. Um, so anyway, a big strict censorship law. And we're done. And... Um, I don't think that one's worth it or that one. Um, Let's Encrypt is the free certificate um, service. It's the top one in the world. It's, uh, and they have, they, they, 2% of their certificates have a deep a defect. So they're recalling them and reissuing them. Um, Let's in, I'm going to have a project in 129S probably by tomorrow night. I'm working on it. Where you make a secure website, you make your own HTTPS certificate and secure it. And then you make your own code signing certificate so you can sign code. Those are things we should know how to do and I'll put it in 129S. I have a need to sign some stuff myself. So I figured, well, I might as well write a project about it. That's a basic activity that should be somewhere in my list of projects. So I'll have that 129S uh, soon. And um, Google canceled IO because of coronavirus, which was their big event. Um, the Game Developers Conference was canceled. Um, Twitter has told everybody to work at home in the United States entirely, but several other big companies have said no travel, not even in the country. 
people are freaking out about coronavirus. So if this continues, I expect the college to be shut too. Now, I don't have any official word from the college administration, but there has been an official word from the government that all school districts are free to close at their discretion when they think it's necessary. And I think it's five days ago that London Breed declared a local state of emergency here in San Francisco. And I figure as soon as we have like a death in San Francisco, they will freak and close everything. So um, what I plan to do if that happens is I'll just continue to teach the classes before like I did when I was sick, where I'll have the Zoom sessions and we won't have a physical meeting. Um, but if you're trying to get credit and degrees and certificates, then you'll need the administration to accept it as an official class. And I don't know what they'll do about that. Um, you can usually count on the administration here to be asleep and have no idea what they're doing, but we'll find out. Um, anyway, I would, if, I would be very surprised if we make it through the next two weeks without them canceling class meetings like this over the coronavirus because people are all freaking out. Yeah. Yeah, I see, I, but I think that they're all, they, the, to be fair, with the problem with them is there's rules and laws and any class that's not really an official online class, this is officially a face-to-face -face class. So letting it continue on an online basis, I think would probably violate some rule. And in order for, the reason why I do it this way is because to be an official online class, there are a bunch of incredibly burdensome administrative rules. I couldn't have anybody in there that was not officially enrolled. Everything would have to be in Canvas. I couldn't put it on my own website. It's just, it, it was a whole bunch of really irritating things that would mess up the class. So technically this class does not meet the requirements to be an online class. And therefore, technically, giving you credit for it when, in fact, it was delivered online might break some rules. So anyway, I'll do it anyway, ignoring their rules. But as far as the official credit goes, we have to wait for a statement from the administration. Anyway, they haven't shut yet. Maybe they won't shut, but I don't see how that can be avoided. Um, anyway, this is interesting. They're now going to have a cybersecurity label for smart devices in Singapore, and they're planning to have one in Europe. They've been talking about this for years. If they could just have a label on your device, like this device is secure, like dolphin safe tuna, so the consumer could tell. Then people could pay an extra few bucks for it, and that might be good. And so there, hopefully this label will mean it doesn't make the obvious blunders, like a hard-coded default password, an open listening port. And so uh, for years they've been talking about this. Just saying it doesn't have the OWASP top 10 would seem to be enough. And so Singapore is trying to get this ready. They haven't implemented it yet. Um, Mudge, the, one of the famous, most famous hackers in America, um, has been trying for years to get this in America. They called it cyber UL listing. You know, around 1910 and 1920, a lot of people died in fires and stuff because electrical devices were very unsafe. And so the UL listing came out where they put this label on the box that says this device meets certain safety standards. It's got insulation and a grounding plug and stuff. And then people would buy the devices with the UL mark. And they're trying to have that for cybersecurity. But it never seems to happen. I think mostly because we have a lack of security metrics so there is no agreement on what the test should be and what the criteria should be. But you know, if they would just settle on something like the OWASP top 10, it seems like it would be a step up. But anyway, um, and uh, this is pretty awesome. And I think worth mentioning, even though I'm going a little longer than usual, this is how people are hacking into cars. This report is like a technical uh, college, a research paper from a real college. So one thing about research papers from a real college is you can never understand a word they say, including in the headline. So this says dismantling DST-based immobilizer system. What they're talking about is stealing your Tesla. They really need to go through a marketing department. This should be how to steal your Tesla. And the point is they analyzed the encryption in those key fobs to open your car is proprietary. It's a secret. And so what these guys did is they figured out a way to overcome that. And they took, um, they used a Raspberry Pi and they, hooked it up to the chip that holds the firmware, and they did a voltage glitch, and they managed to suck the firmware off the car's chip. Then they reverse engineered it in assembly code and figured out how it worked and figured out what the algorithm is, and it is bad. Anytime anybody won't tell you what they're using, it's bad, because it should be something like AES, and if it's not, they're probably doing something horrible. And what they have is, it's an 80-bit key, which is pretty bad, and then it's implemented very badly. So in fact, here's the end results are down here. This is the punchline chart is down at the end. Um, I found, there it is. Uh, yeah, this is the one. So Toyota uses a key which is completely predictable. It's like the serial number of the device and the model number of the car or something. So you don't even have to make multiple guesses. All you have to do is get within radio range and you can immediately tell what code to send to Toyota to take it over. Kias and Hyundai's 
use an authentication system, but they do it wrong. So there's only, um, uh, all you have to do is record one trace and then crack it offline to get in. And this is with a complexity of two to the 24 which is equal to web attack. So it's as easy to crack as web. You can totally do it in homework for like five minutes. You, the, the randomness is too small. And Tesla and all the general key fobs use a broken algorithm. So it looks to me like a meet in the middle attack or something. It should have complexity two to the 80, but in fact, it's around two to the 40. And two to the 40, as we all know, is not enough. Two to the 40 is CSS, the content scrambling system for DVDs. That's been broken for like 30 years. Two to the 56 is DES, which was broken in 1997. So cracking something with only two to the 40 combinations is trivial. You can totally do it on a desktop computer. So this is pretty awful and it's leaked out now. Anyway, so that's good, clean fun. Um, nice to see cryptanalysis work. And, um, and this is what you always know. If so, he, he won't tell you what the encryption is. Don't buy that crap. It's never good. And that's why I actually made a proprietary encryption scheme to make some digital badges for some students that are taking my commercial courses. And then I realized I should never do that. I should just sign it with a normal signing certificate. That's why I'm going to get one from Electric Grip. I'm being an idiot. I'm inventing my own crypto when I know better. Never write your own crypto. Whatever you're doing, it's wrong. Use the standard stuff. Don't try to be creative. Use the normal thing is <laughs> the best thing to do. So I'm going to use a Let's Encrypt certificate and sign it like code. That's my plan. Yeah. Well, what happens is um, anybody can create one and publish it. It's just scientific research. But the ones that get certain labels are approved by the government. And that's the National Institute of Standards. So they have like a competition. So they're like, when they had DES was the official standard from the government. And when they could no longer pretend that DES was safe, they decided to have a new one. And so they had a uh, submission process. They put out an invitation to everybody. All the people of the world, please submit your algorithm for competition to win the award of becoming AES. And for like five years, they'd come in and then they would publish them and everybody would try to hack them. And if somebody hacked them, they'd take them down. Then they got it down to like some finalists and then they took one of the finalists and gave them the award of being stamped AES, the official government standard. So that's why there's an official government one, which is approved for use and in, in secret and everything. And then there's like the five runners up, which are really good too. And those are free for anybody to use, but they're not the official recommended standard. So a lot of people use those, but if you want to do business with the government, you use the real official standard. And the same, that's what happens. So it's not like, that's how official it is. And other nations, by the way, like the Russian, uh, we do the cryptography class, I think it's coming around next semester, we'll talk about this. Russia has their hashing encryption routines that are different than ours, and China has theirs. Their government has just chosen to approve different ones. And you know, so, and of course there are persistent rumors based on many, many proven examples that it's a corrupt system and the government tends to approve one because they found a backdoor into it. They don't tell you. So that's why a lot of people will deliberately use another nation's one and not your nation or one that was not chosen. Hope till the government didn't get a chance to supposedly put a backdoor on it because they really did that several times and got caught. But as far as anybody has published openly, there is no backdoor in AES and it's perfectly fine. But if you are the kind of person that doesn't trust your government, you know, I can't imagine anybody being that way. But if you have that, then you would use one of the others, the runners up, like uh, like uh, Blowfish or Two Fish. There's like five or six that are considered just as good, but not officially approved by the government. But if you do that, then the government won't want to use your stuff because they want to see the standard encryption in there. So if you're planning to sell to the government, like Microsoft or Apple, then you use the standard stuff. But whatever you do, don't invent your own. That is the road to humiliation and ruin. Anyway, so we're going to talk about... Um, Android implementation problems. So uh, there's, I put this lecture up into three pieces. So we'll start up here through privilege levels and pre-installed applications, which is where most of the phones are. So this kind of stuff we can't really do in emulators as we'll talk about. Um, and then we'll get to physical attacks and man in the middle attacks and injection attacks later. So uh, it turns out that most of the vulnerabilities in Android devices are not really from Google, which is what you might expect. Google runs a pretty tight ship. They have bug bounties. They pay out a lot of, they really try hard to secure their stuff. So the code that Google wrote is pretty good, but the manufacturers that sell phones add a bunch of proprietary code on it. The same thing's true of Windows. You buy Windows and you get like the HP backup utility and that stuff is usually crap written by some company to stick on their branded stuff. And the same thing's true of phones. So um, you can see this by looking at the attack surface. You can try, if you exploit an app, if you find something like a buffer overflow or an injection flaw in an app, then you'll be able to 
send code to an app, and now it will do whatever the app can do. But most apps are not running as root. So you don't have root privilege. Um, but you can often exfiltrate user data, like the data stored in that app. So if you want to get real power, you want to find a powerful app. Now, um, an app with the install packages permission has the ability to install more software on your phone. And some people do that to have like custom update mechanisms because the official update mechanism is an alert will come up and tell you go to the Play Store and get the next version. And some apps want to have some other update mechanism so they write their own. So now that app has to have the ability to install software. And that means if you exploit that app, you'll have the ability to install more malware on the phone. So that's pretty bad. Um, so if you're on Drozier on an emulator, you can do this to see which packages have install packages. And on my emulator, it was the Google Play Store has it, of course, and something called Package Installer and a few other things, the shell. Only a few things have it on an emulator. If you run an emulator for these permissions, you'll find very few apps that have it because emulators are really naked. Emulators are just a copy of the default Android from the Google site with like a couple more things in it to connect to the emulator. Whereas real phones are a copy of the, the Android from the Google site, plus all the proprietary stuff that Samsung or somebody felt like putting on there. And that turns out to be a lot of software and really badly written, which I think all of us that are using Windows know. I learned something the hard way. I buy a Windows XP machine. It never works. The only thing you can do is flatten it and reinstall the OS because they fill it with malware before they give it to you. They don't like to admit it's malware, but they fill it with junk that's crashy and slows it down and doesn't work. It's not like malware in the sense of a virus, but it's just poorly written software that slows it down and doesn't work. And it's ridiculous. And it's because, by the way, of the antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft. Microsoft was sued, and they accused them of being a monopoly, and therefore they specified four types of applications that Microsoft can never block from putting on new computers, which was browsers, photo utilities, backup utilities, and something else. So everybody put backup utilities and photo utilities all full of ads and marketing and spyware on the computers to sell to you because it's just more free extra money for them. And Microsoft can't stop it, even though the stuff is terrible, until they started selling their own hardware. And Microsoft got so fed up around the time of Vista and Windows 7, they said, you know, here we work hard on writing a good operating system. And the people who actually buy like HP or Dell, they have a terrible experience because they take our product and ruin it before they sell it to people. They say the only legal way we can prevent that is to make our own hardware, which they didn't want to do. But now we'll sell it. Microsoft Surface, and you will actually get the experience that Microsoft intended you to have without a bunch of crap on top of it. And those things are pretty hot. Surface users are pretty happy. Anyway, so it's um, these are the unintended consequences of these lawsuits. Anyway, so if you run um, on an emulator, you'll find very few, but real devices will have many more with this installed permission. If you look at how many apps are running a system, it's only a few on the emulator, but 66 in the book on a real a Samsung phone. So they make a bunch of apps and they run a system, which is like running as, as root high privileges, which is the kind of thing you shouldn't be doing, but they do. And any, if any of those apps have a flaw and you compromise them, then you get system privileges, which is why it's a poor idea to run anything, more things as system than necessary. So remote attack vectors, there's two ways to attack a computer. You attack the server by finding a listening port and find some kind of data you can send it to take it over. If you wanna infect the client, then you trick the client into installing opening malicious document or somehow downloading malicious file. That's typically how you do it. Um, so the things that process files that come from outside the phone are things like browsers and document readers. So you'll have a malicious web page that puts files on there, or you'll have some kind of PDF or some file they download. So these are often vulnerable because they take untrusted input. And so you can use fuzzers uh, to send many, many mutated uh, pieces of data in to see what crashes. Samsung had Polaris Viewer for PDF. Uh, there was no PDF viewer at all on my Android. This would see if anything can handle applications like PDF. And on my emulator, there's no PDF reader. And this is why um, we'll get later, I wrote a new project where you analyze some Android malware. And you can't really run it in these emulators because malware mostly wants to steal like the SMS messages. And your emulator doesn't have SMS, doesn't have a PDF reader. It attacks the things that are not really in the emulator. You really have to do and malware analysis on a real phone. But anyway, we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Um, browsable activities. Uh, you can have a web page and you can say, click on a link. You've probably seen this, like get our app, click on this link. And then it says, shall I open that link in like Android uh, store or uh, Apple play? There are links that go to the real store. So that means that link is opening a different app. And that's what these things are called browsable. Browsable means there is going to be a method, which when clicked will launch my app from a web page, which is of convenience for the user, but of course, fairly dangerous. 
So um, you can make an example from, I made a rogue Drozier agent, and here's what you put in the Android manifest. You declare it browsable here, and then you specify the scheme, and this scheme is PWM, Pwn. So now you can make a link, you can hop like HTTP colon or HTTPS colon, but if you make a link that is Pwn colon, when people click that, it will launch my Drozier action, which would be a thing installed on the phone. So um, you can do it, this is the simplest way, ahref, pwn something, start Drozer. You can also do it with this intent thing. This is another method in Android phones that launches an intent and then you put the scheme in another part of the URL. It amounts to the same thing. Now, of course, here you'd have to do social engineering. You'd have to say, click here to win $1,000 or something, get them to click it. Uh, what would be cooler would be to put this in an image tag or an iframe so it automatically clicks that link as soon as you view the page. But they're onto that and modern versions of Android will not let you do that. You can't put it in an iframe anymore. It won't open because that was, that was, that's, those are called drive-by attacks where you just open the page in your host. You don't even download a file or click anything. And they try hard to patch those, of course. So um, I tried how many apps have browsable things on my phone. There were quite a few. Blackboard, which is a college app like Canvas, was browsable. Um, messaging was browsable. The Fidelity app was browsable. I don't know why the Fidelity banking app wants to take messaging and website, but apparently it does. Anyway, um, all right. And then like I say, some people write a custom update mechanism. Like I've mentioned, if you were to just open links in the default browser and update in the Google Play Store, you'd be pretty safe because both of those are going to Google code, which is probably better written than anything your company makes. But it's a lousy user experience. They're in your app, they're seeing your color and your logo, then they click a link, they go to some other app, they're not gonna come back. People want to contain the customer on my site. So they use web views to open web pages in the app and they don't want you to go to Google Play to update it, they wanna update it right there in the app in some automatic mechanism. So that's what happens here, um, they will, now have some proprietary way of downloading the file, and it might be something foolish. I started researching how uh, and antivirus software updated about five years ago. I checked Kaspersky's updates come over HTTP, and I was starting to write a notification to Kaspersky, and I said, no, no, this can't be right. It can't be that Kaspersky didn't protect it. And I Googled and checked. Kaspersky had written right paper. For some ungodly reason, Kaspersky wrote their own secure protocol to replace HTTPS. Because I said, before I do this, I'm gonna actually try to intercept the traffic from Kaspersky and add a string to it and see that it goes on my device before I go telling I found a hole in Kaspersky. That's very hard to believe, and it didn't work. They actually have some protocol where they connect to a server, verify the key and everything. For some reason, they don't use standard HTTPS. They built their own servers to receive, it's weird, but it is, does, it is protected. But normally, you know, if somebody doesn't use HTTPS, then all you have to do is intercept the traffic with Burp or any other tool, modify the traffic, and I can add malware to the update. So everybody should be getting all their updates over HTTPS at least. And it ought to all be signed code and stuff. Anyway, so then you can talk about runtime addition of code, which is completely insane. This is just asking you to get owned. And that's the, this is the Android function that does this. Dex class loader will load data while your app is running from a jar or an APK file, hitting a class, just load data, it will add extra code while it's running. What good clean fun is that? I mean, anyway, this is the function you can use to add other code while it's running, which is, by the way, the same thing as Microsoft um, Windows DILLs, dynamically loaded linked library. You're running the thing, then you can set a line and say, oh, add more code right now, just add this other thing. This is very handy for attackers. <laughs> Just trick it into adding the wrong code. So you can add new code, and there's a thing called the Java Reflection API. Dex, this is one way to do it, which we'll talk more about later. Dex Flash Loader, these loads code over the network or somewhere else, and therefore, obviously, you have a vulnerable code injection. If you can trick it into adding malicious code instead of the official code, then it's running your code. Um, web views, we've talked, so here's a recipe for disaster. We talked about web views. These are the four things which were very common uh, that caused Android apps to be vulnerable. You'd define a JavaScript interface in, in your code. Then you would um, load from a clear text source or with broken HTTPS so people can modify the transmissions. And then you would um, use a web view, of course, to load data. And you'd have an older API version. And if you did this, because there was a vulnerability in Android here, CVE 2012, 6636, which means you can use the JavaScript interface method to run Java code. You can call the Java classes from the web page. This means I can now run any part of your app from JavaScript and I can inject JavaScript on the fly. So you use your app innocently, 
And when it downloads code for the JavaScript interface, I modify that code and I can not only just take over the JavaScript functions in your app, I can now run the Java functions in your app and do anything your app can do. It's basically free code injection with the power of your app. So, all right, that's, that's a category of vulnerabilities. And of course, this one was passed in 2012 and that lowered the risk of this, but it's not like it's gone by any means. Uh, now you might have listening ports from apps. This is extremely clumsy. If you want to put a backdoor on a server to own it with like a rootkit, the sleaziest thing you could do is just start listening on a port. You'll get caught. Firewalls will block it. I mean, this is lame. So very few apps are this dumb. The, one of them being the one we did before, the uh, File Explorer. ES File Explorer just listens on a port like 59,000 and serves off all your files. That is really, really lame. And that's because that was not malware written by intelligent attackers. That was just sloppily written genuine app where for some ungodly reason, they put that in and forgot to take it out. Most, you won't just find it with Netstat, but you can check for it. Um, I tried running a whole bunch of malware the last few days to see if somebody would do this, and nobody's dumb enough to do this. It's hard to find anybody dumb enough to do this with malware. Not only will you get caught, other people will take your botnet away from you. You know, you can't be that lame. <laughs> um, so messaging applications, of course, there's all over the place that take data, SMS and email and chat. And they all of them may be vulnerable with Malfor and chat. When the Windows phone first came out, I had a bunch of friends that worked at Microsoft. And it was really hilarious because they were the only people on earth that had Windows phones. Nobody else got them. And they all had Windows phones. And I would go out to dinner. They'd say, OK, I just got a message. Oh, shit. Their phone would die. There was an SMS of death. You would get an SMS. You read like five or 10. Then your phone would die. There was, they, never, they didn't know quite what it was. It was one of a certain length or one of a certain character. But it happened really often. The, the thing would go beep. You pull it out, and poof, it's dead. <laughs> I thought that was pretty hilarious. Anyway, um, so if you want to find local vulnerabilities, then you do what I've been doing, install a bunch of apps, um, convert them to source code, look for grep to search for vulnerability. That's one way to do it. Or you can use Drozer Scanner on the live app, or there are many other ways. And I'll show you later, you can do it with VirusTotal. Um, Drozer has a SQL injection vulnerability scanner. Vuln scanners are in general pretty bad. You have to be aware they only have like a 50% chance of finding vulnerabilities and Drozer's SQL injection scanner is no exception. It can't even find SQL injection in SIV, which is the vulnerable app they give you with Drozer to demonstrate its features. So that's pretty sad that it can't even, if I was in the marketing department, I would say, look, make sure that it works on our official test case. Get real here. But anyway, um, it's a free product, you know, this is what you get. So, all right. Um, so to exploit your device, you can have a remote exploit, which is awesome, where you get, a, um, you can just take over the device over the network, which will do, there's a project here where you put in a real Metasploit module, where you actually have Metasploit reverse shell, and you can just totally take it over the internet. And local exploits are simpler, where you have to already have an app on the phone under your control. And this is, of course, you have to somehow trick them into installing malware, which you control. Now you can attack other apps on the phone from the app that's already on there. These are both common. All right, and so there's attack tools out there. Ettercap is the main one used for real man in the middle attacks. It does art poisoning to redirect the traffic on a network to go through you. It does DNS spoofing to send false DNS requests to tell everybody to go to you to get to every website so all the traffic passes through your machine and so on. That's what you do. Now what we're doing for our tests is just setting the uh, proxy server in the Android settings and that's fine to find the vulnerability but obviously you can't attack real users that way. They're not going to go in settings and adjust. You have to use this. This is how you actually do man in the middle attacks on a real network, which by the way, is not that easy anymore at all because most people like Starbucks and city college have wised up and turned on isolation mode. So you are not really on the same local network as the other users, which is what's required here. Um, I think Phil's you still are, but anyway, most people have now you put everybody on their own VLAN to stop this because this is an old trick, and so many people get owned that people begin to get fed up with it. Um, Burp, we're using a lot. You know, Burp is awesome. If you can get in the middle, Burp will make fake certificates and let you see the traffic and search through it, and it's wonderful. Uh, the problem is Android 7 no longer put, lets you put in a trusted CA. Somehow I thought I had earlier in the class, but I tried early this week, and it totally doesn't work, and I found official blogs. Android 7 and up will not trust uh, individual CA, and there seems to be no easy way to get around that. There are two or three solutions that are really pretty exotic and painful. So anyway, um, uh, the only way I know to do that practically is to use hardware. Uh, you can take like a Mac running Burp and you can share the network. So you become an access point and then connect to that access point. That's putting you physically in the middle. Then you don't have to read it. That's, that's the way to defeat everything. Yeah. Sure. 
or the, uh, uh, any kind of, yeah, you make a malicious router, the Wi-Fi pineapple would work or anything like that. You know, just physically get in the middle. That's why, you know, you could just like cut the cable and plug your computer in the middle of the wire and that would get you in the middle, right? You don't know our progeny, you know nothing. Then you'd have to trick people into joining your wireless network. Yeah, anyway, so um, here's the BERT page about it saying Android Nougat, which is seven and up, no longer lets you do this. And that's absolutely true. I've been trying it and finding that to be true. So then there's burp extensions that let you add Python code, but I found they didn't work very well and I tested them. Um, I, in general, I don't need to write Python inside burp, just write Python scripts. <laughs> They're not that hard to write. And then you can modify traffic there. Anyway, Drozer has this thing called infrastructure mode, which is for making your own botnet, having a server and controlling others, um, like Metasploit. But I, I lost interest when I found out how easy it is to just use Metasploit to make Android malware and put it on the phone. You can just use the same old Metasploit that we use for Windows and Linux and Mac and everything. It totally works to just put Metasploit malware on your phone. Now, I'm pretty sure I have that project in this class. Let me just make sure I do. Um, I know I wrote it, but I'm not sure I have all the projects in this version of this class. Um, do I have making a Metasploit? Um, yeah, Trojaning. No, that's that one. Uh, yeah, maybe I don't. Maybe I'll have to look for that. I thought I had, you totally can use Metasploit to make malware and put it in Android apps and put it on the phone and get a remote shell. Um, I'll see if I can add that back in if it's not here. I'm not seeing it. Anyway, so, um, all right. And so we'll talk about privilege levels. Once you get some ability to run code on the phone, there are in fact a lot of different levels. Um, if you have like a shell for a web browser, then you just have control of one app and you can only do what that one app can do. So you can only reach the file system that that app's allowed to get to. Remember the sandbox, every app runs as its own user account and it's not allowed to go in other apps files. So you can't really read SMS or run Java packages very much. Um, you're very limited. All you can do is steal the data in that app. Um, if you become a non-system app with context, context is another layer, you can retrieve the app context and then you have, can do anything. This one, you can only do limited things inside the app. This one, you can do anything the app can do. And then there's an installed package. This is where you've actually tricked somebody into installing their malicious app on the phone. Now you have an installed package, and now you have any permissions that they agree to. When you install the app, it pops up. This app will be able to access your microphone, your camera, the network, and whatever they agree to, you can do that. So if you can get them to agree to all sorts of outrageous permissions, which is usually very easy because most people don't even read that, then you can have all those permissions. And then there's ADB shell, which is what we're using. You have a shell and you can install apps as you know and pull them off the phone. Uh, but that's not complete ownership of the phone, which is what I found out. In order to make it accept user third-party certificates, you have to copy them into a system folder and you can't even do it from an ADB shell, which is what I tried. You totally can't. That is mounted as read-only. For as far as ADV is concerned. To do that, you need system. And this is like, um, on, Lin on Windows, it's the same. If you're the administrator, you don't have as much privilege as if you were system. And so anyway, that's the system user that can do anything. And it's hard to get up to system. And they're technically root up here too, manipulate any access to the device. Um, anyway, so uh, I've got a few cahoots about that. And then I'll just uh, talk to you about the new project, which is very easy. You probably have fun. Um, it's sort of embarrassingly easy, but it seemed like it was worth doing because we aren't using Android malware very much, and it is our foray into Android malware in this class. And so choose a way to, what is this hogwash? Host live. Yes, that was the plan. Looks like they're updating Kahoot and adding new features. I hate it when people add new features because I'm like boring and I just want to use everything the normal way. But anyway, all right. Um, let's see if this works. I've got glorious music. There we are. All right. Let's see, I've got four people online, maybe six in a room, so this ought to get up to like eight or ten. You know, I, my impression is that this is not Florida. Just for a wild guess. I thought you were down there with alligators and turtles and stuff. <laughs> you have what? Oh, okay, great. Well, I'm glad you're back. Their loss is our gain. Uh, 
I think I know who this might be. The skull. Well, that's like a that's like the uh, the Spectre meltdown thing, isn't it? Awesome. That can't be the officially emoting, don't you? Oh, okay. Well, that's pretty cool. You know you've arrived when they make your thing into an emoji. You make a vulnerability, make a logo, and then you make an emoji. You're really a cool dad. All right. Well, let's see what we got here. All right. So what permissions do you need for custom updates? Okay, yep, we got install packages. All right, so Rich is the winner, defeating the evil specter in Meltdown. So, uh, all right. What intent filter is required to open a URL? Like poem, poem, poem. Okay, that's browsable, good. And, aha, this is sort of like the, the, uh, the, the democratic, you know, race. Anyway, uh, all right, which Java class allows an app to load new code at runtime? Which is, of course, powerful and useful and versatile, but dangerous. That's class loader. Add more code while it's running. What could go wrong? Anyway, so there we go. Rich is maintaining a lead. And what component may allow a web page to execute Java code? Web views, all right, that's the component that does it. All right, so let's see what the contest leads to. Alex, Rich, nice. There you go, okay. Well, good for you. you Came out at the last minute, June ahead, just like five. Anyway, so all right. So um, let me just show you the new project. I just got it up here, and like I say, it is very easy, but it might be good um, for people who haven't looked at malware very much, and it might be true in this class. We're not specifically doing malware in here because you can't run malware in emulators. But what you can do is analyze them without running, and that turned. See, I found a nice. Um, so I added this here. It's extra credit. Uh, just using virus total to analyze Android malware. I found this like earlier this week, somebody's repository of Android malware. Dozens and dozens and hundreds. I said, this is gonna be great. And a lot of this is the famous stuff that hit the news and everywhere that was in Google Play and all sorts of places, but none of it will run on my emulator. And when it does, it doesn't do anything malicious because the command and control servers are down and a lot of Android malware detects emulators. And I thought I might find something old or some kind of trick. And I didn't find any way to make any of this stuff do anything fun in the emulator. So I was depressed. And then I remembered you can just totally use virus total. Virus total is in fact fantastic. Good. Virus total will run it for you and analyze it and show you the results. It's like it used to be Joe's sandbox. So all you got to do is download one of these things. I got a few of them here. And then go to Virus Total. Virus Total is a Google product. And it used to just be like Windows files. It'll tell you if it's malicious. But now it'll analyze Android files. And it will do a really good job. So you take one of these malicious Android files and just dump it there. And the first thing it tells you is what all the antivirus engines think of it. And of course, a whole bunch of them think this stuff is malicious. Because this is, of course, famous samples of malware from years ago. But then you go to details. And it's really bloody awesome. It gives you... Uh, the hashes, it tells you the names of the files inside the package, it tells you the certificate, the dates it was valid, um, it tells you who signed it. This is from somebody in Italy and Rome, and it tells you what permissions it has. Remember, we said when you install an app, you use the permissions. This one has internet, access location, read SMS, receive SMS, those are all the permissions it has. It's probably something like a banking Trojan stealing your SMS codes. Here's the activities it has, here's the services, here's the receivers. This is just what you'd see in Drozer. It's really fantastic. Here's the intent filters by action, um, by category. 
here's all the strings that they thought were interesting, which are a lot of URLs it goes to. So if it had like a command and control center, you'd find it here. And um, there's bundle info. And then you got relations to other things, like all the IP addresses it contacts. So you can look for command and control server. You can go look those up, Google those on other places and see if they're known malicious ones. And then behavior which means they ran it in a virtual machine for you and they watered the traffic. You see it, these are the HTTP requests it made, each one of them. Here's all the DNS resolutions it made. Here's all the IP addresses it contacted. Here's all the files it opened, all the files it wrote, all the files it deleted. This is really cool. And you don't have to have an emulator or anything. It's like, it's really getting very far along. They do a lot for you. So you can thoroughly analyze malware pretty far without an emulator or anything a real phone just by here and looking at what it does. So it's pretty awesome. And it's not doing this, you know, it, it will do it. So this is a great, good, clean fun. So I just made a project where you have to analyze some of these and hunt through these and find out what it's doing. Because it is a perfectly good way to analyze malware. That's why, you know, um, my classes are slowly getting less and less technical as these free online tools get more and more powerful. Instead of making people set up a Linux server and install a bunch of crap and do something, you just send it to some web service that just does it for you which is what should happen, right? At some point, security should become a commodity where you just like buy something and turn it on and it does it for you. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're a lot closer to it. A lot of the difficult security tasks are now automated with tools that are cheap or free where you can just plug something in and get the answer without doing it yourself. Anyway, so that's the new project. Yeah. Uh, you can that, uh, that turned it manually and have a better edge well, I think, um, well, this is, a, this is actually a very difficult question. Um, if I, I have a statement you know, I made, always made in this class, which is you could argue that I'm totally wasting your time and this is all bullshit because we don't have any security metrics. We would like to say your current security level is five, but if you send your class, if you send your executives off your cybersecurity team and they all get CISSPs, your level will go up to six and that will save you this many million dollars. And we don't have anything like that. Like you say, we can't even agree to what would make a secure webcam different than a non-secure webcam so we can put a sticker on it. We can't even agree on what those rules would be. So it is very far from science. This is just an arch. There is a common belief that if you actually understand what's happening, you'll be more effective. There is no evidence for that, however. Uh, for example, knowing all the latest attacks would seem like a good idea, but when Rapid7 scanned the entire internet for, for what was happening and all the real malware they could find, they found that like almost all the attacks used things that had been patched five years ago. People are getting owned because they run like Windows Server 2012 or something, not because they didn't have enough researchers finding the latest zero day. That is extremely rare. Um, so, you know, and all the secret experts say, you know, you can go to classes and get degrees and certifications all day long, but if you would just do the obvious stuff, like get people to stop reusing passwords, don't let people install weird games they bring in from home, just do like the simple hygiene stuff. That'll do more to save you than all the complicated fancy stuff. So anyway, it's, um, that's a very good question. I would, uh, I teach classes so you actually understand what's happening just because that's what I learned from the world of science. You should really know what's going on on your phone to protect it. And that's one way to go. That's where the technical oriented people go. Management people just say, which product works? I'll just buy that product. And they've got a point too. You know, there's, there's many different levels. And, uh, you know, it's, this is just a huge exploding ecosystem from a simple, from a simple point, rather than knowing whether we're saving the world, just whether you can get a job. It's much more simple. Every possible breach of security is growing like crazy. Non-technical people are greatly needed for things like compliance and legal and HR and everything and PR and documentation and managing teams. There's like, you know, just like in the military, I think they said there are like 18 people behind every frontline combat soldier. And they are like fixing the radios, fixing the cars, making the food, delivering the uniforms, doing all that. The same thing in cybersecurity. There's these pen testers at the front line and behind them, there's many, many people doing ordinary business functions just to feed them. And so, all those are exploding like crazy. So if you just learn something and get pretty good at it, you should be employable um, in the current madness of chaos because we're losing and the attacks and the breaches just go up and up and up. So everybody panics and just hires more and more and more security people, assuming that somehow this will save you. Just like when there's a gang war and dead bodies in the street, you put out more cops, hoping that that will do something about it without really knowing it will, but it seems like the right thing to do. Yeah. Actually, 
Well, I know the one, uh, Security Plus is greatly respected for beginning jobs. And CISSP is the one every professional is expected to have. And there are a lot of specialized ones. OSCP is why greatly respected for pen testers. And there are specialized ones in other areas like, you know, Cisco, CCIE for that. And, and uh, but those are the, the really big value ones are Security Plus and CISSP in the world of security. No matter who you are, you need a CISSP. Even if you're a hands-on pen tester and you, and they usually complain like crazy because the CICP has no technical components really, no hands-on, but everyone expects you to have it. It just supposedly means you understand management enough to cooperate with management. That's the point. And even if you're not management, it would be good for you to know that much about it. That's the theory. And the other theory is it has an ethics clause and you can lose it for unethical conduct. So supposedly if you have a CISSP, that means I can trust you to like not betray us and not leak our secrets and stuff like that. It's not just the honor system. It's just like an MD or a degree to practice law. There is an organization's body and people can file an ethics complaint about you and you have to defend yourself or lose it. I've had it happen. People file an ethics complaint against me to take away my credential from that body and I defended myself and beat it back. But that's the thing. You, you are there to some extent, you are held to a certain standard. It's like the license of being in this business. For example, we've had, we had a treacherous chief technology officer at this college that states a fake virus update a fake virus outbreak to basically trick us into spending a bunch of money with one of his pals and hit the press and created a worldwide scandal. And when they hired him, he didn't have a CISSP. I was going to complain and have it, but they didn't put on requirements. He didn't have one. And if he had had one, I could have had it revoked for doing that, which that's why they like you to have it. It makes HR and legal and everybody happy that you have this thing. Then there is some degree of accountability for what you do. All in practice, it doesn't seem to work very well, but I think you could say the same thing for medical degrees and legal degrees. It's not like there aren't a lot of crooked lawyers and doctors out there, but in principle, you could do something eventually. If they do horrible stuff long enough, eventually you could like take away their license. But um, there's dozens of others and they're all good in little specialties. Yeah. And by the way, there's a large number of people like I would guess maybe 30% of the job market that just hate all this. I don't care about degrees. I don't care about certifications. I just want to know, are you a hacker? Can you get in? And I'm perfectly happy. You know, if you just did it all in your garage and you have three felony convictions, I want the best hacker. There's a bunch of people like that. They just say, this is all crap. And then there's organized places like the military. They really want to see certifications and special rules and huge corporations. They just have HR rules. You must have a master's in, in computer science or you won't even look at you or something. Usually a bachelor's in computer science is what they all write because it's easy to put on there. And the actual teams doing security are always frustrated because they do. This is not computer science. Oh, the people that have computer science degrees don't know how to do this. I wish HR would quit doing that, but it's easy for them to say, oh, the bachelor's in computer science stamp. You know, that's why um, one of my students is applying for jobs. And she said, you know, I, I realized that I went to talk to people at RSA and they said, your thing is going through a keyword scanner. So you have to make sure that these words appear on it. So you're customizing your resume to put the right keywords on it. Yeah, you know, it's, but that's what happens when you get to be big business. You have all the usual big business frustrations come in. And that's why, you know, I get mad at the administration here. And that's partly because they're incompetent crooks. And it's partly because their job is just really, really frustrating. They have to obey the California state laws about colleges, which are an ever changing minefield of stupid rules and regulations and the funding requirements and everything. So I say, I'll put my class online. I'll just put a microphone here and put it on the web. There, I'm done. And they're like, dude, there's so much more you have to do to make an official approved online course, which I don't want to do, but which they correctly say you'd have to do to make an official online course. That's the way it is. You know? <laughs> anyway, um, good. Any other questions? If anybody online has a question, pop up the chat. I think I'll stop the recording, but I'll leave the, the online thing going for a little while.